Hi everybody and welcome to a new video in the audio signal processing for machine learning series. This time I'll be introducing the Fourier transform. Now, when I was uh, planning this video, I thought, what's the best way of introducing the Fourier transform? And I thought, well, perhaps I should just give you a little bit of an intuition there and then go straight into uh, implementation or even just use Libroso for uh, extracting a spectrum through the uh, Fourier transform. But then I thought, well, the Fourier transform is at the core of signal processing. So just sprinkling a little bit of math here and there and intuition is not going to be enough for you. So you really want to have a deep understanding of the Fourier transform and all of its implications. This is why I've decided to divide this topic into a, a number of videos. And this first video is going to give you a, an introduction and the high level of intuition of uh, the Fourier transform, but towards the end, I'll just be giving you a little bit of math to formalize what we'll be discussing throughout uh, the video. So stay tuned for more about the Fourier transform. But before we get started, I want to invite you once again to the Sound of AI Slack community. If you don't know it, this is a community where uh, we are a bunch of people interested in AI music, signal processing, AI audio, all of these kind of things. And there you can ask for feedback, improve your skills, share research and talk with very cool people. So if you're interested in that, just go check out the sign up link in the description below. Okay, now on to the real stuff. To uh, introduce the concept of, uh, that are behind um, the Fourier transform, I want to use an analogy here. And for that, I'm going to use one of the most iconic cover ever created in the rock world and from one of the bands that I love the most, Pink Floyd. So this is the cover for Dark Side of the Moon. So what does this have to do with the Fourier transform? Well, it's the analogy here that counts a lot. So here we have a, a beam, a light beam, right? So this is a complex um, uh, waveform. It goes through a prism and then out of the prism, we get uh, the different like spectral bands, the different colors divided, right? So the basic idea is complex waveform. We have kind of like a machine or an algorithm, which in this case is the prism. And then we get all the different components which make up uh, light, okay? So with the Fourier transform, we do something that's very, very similar to this. So the high level intuition here is that we have a complex sound and then using the Fourier transform, which in our analogy is the prism, we decompose the complex sound into its frequency components. Because if you remember from one of my initial videos, uh, complex sounds are made up of many different uh, pure tones added up, superimposed uh, together. Okay, so this is like basically the first intuition that you have. Now, when we, we do this, when we use the Fourier transform, what we do really is a journey from the time domain to the frequency domain. So probably if you've followed along this series, you've seen like this type of like slide time and again, but let me uh, repeat that uh, for yeah the sake of yeah understanding everything very deeply. Okay, so here we have like, I sound in a wave plot and here we have time on the x-axis, right? Then we use the Fourier transform, some magic happens and we get the same sound, but this time uh, plotted uh, in the frequency domain. So we have a frequency analysis of the very same sound. And in other words, on the x-axis, we have frequency. And where you see these spikes, it means that the relative um, frequencies at that specific hertz are an important component of that original sound. Now the question is, how do we do this? So how do we go from the time domain to the frequency domain? Well, that's the topic of today's video at an intuition level. Okay, now let's go one level of resolution further uh, down and get like a better intuition of what's going on with the Fourier transform. So 
when we apply the Fourier transform, we do a bunch of things. So the first thing that we do is we compare the original signal with a bunch of sinusoids with various uh, frequencies, right? So we have the original signal and then we have uh, a bunch of sine waves and we want to compare the original signal to those sine waves, which are going to have different frequencies. And so out of that comparison, what we get is a magnitude and a phase. Now, what does the magnitude tell us? Well, uh, the magnitude tells us how similar the uh, original signal and the pure tone or the sine tone are. So the higher the magnitude, the higher the similarity between the original signal and the sinusoid with that specific uh, frequency. Now, we'll take a look at the phase in uh, uh, a few minutes. But here, uh, this is kind of like the, the deeper intuition, but still, it may feel a little bit abstract. So now, let's go to check out some code that I wrote in a Jupyter notebook and see how this applies uh, specifically and just like visualize some of these intuitions. Okay, so now uh, it's not important uh, to look at the code here and many of the stuff that I've, uh, like many of like these lines of code that I've read here, I already explained to you like in previous videos, uh, but what's important is to look at uh, the results of these things. Okay, so now let me get started. So I'll import uh, all of these libraries, which will need to plot and analyze sounds. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is to uh, actually show you the sound that we'll be analyzing. So let's listen to this. Okay, it's just a piano key, specifically it's C5, note C5. Okay, and it's held for almost like a second and a half. Okay, so here we'll just load the audio file with uh, Libroza. As, as I said, uh, you've seen how to do this in previous video if you followed the series. If you haven't, just like check that out. Okay, so the next step is to actually plot the waveform. And yeah, here we have like our nice little waveform. So once again, here we are in the time domain. So X axis is time, Y axis is amplitude. And as you can see, so we have the attack of the sound and then we have a little bit of the decay and then yeah, the sound ends towards like 1.4 seconds. Okay, so the next step is the crucial one, is the one that we use for uh, deriving the Fourier transform. And we do that by using uh, SciPy, specifically the FFT module, and we use the FFT, which stands for Fast Fourier uh, Transform um, function in the FFT module. So we pass it in the signal and we get the Fourier transform. Now, I'm not going to show you what that result actually is because you need to have like a deeper understanding of math, complex numbers, and things like that, which you'll have in a few videos. But for now, the important thing to understand is that if we do the absolute, if we take the absolute value of the Fourier transform, we actually get the magnitudes. And this is the y-axis of our spectrum, whereas on the x-axis, obviously, we have the frequencies. Now, how should we like distribute the frequencies on the um, x-axis? So the frequencies are going to be between 0 hertz and the sampling rate, okay? And then we'll divide this in, in a number of steps that's equal to the length of the, of the magnitude array. Okay, so with all of this in mind, we can now plot the spectrum. And here we go. So here we have the spectrum. And as you can see, we can see a peak in the magnitude around 523 hertz. And this is more or less the, the frequency, the specific frequency for the note C5. And so this is the so-called fundamental of the, of, the, of the sound that we've heard. And then we have a few spikes. 
so here around uh, 1040 um, uh, uh, hertz something and here and a fourth one here and a little bit of a fifth down here but it's almost like unnoticeable that one okay so the this profile is quite specific right and it, and it feels like there there's some like symmetry like natural uh thing to it and it's the fact that this is a harmonic sound in other words these guys over here are harmonics uh, or overtones of the fundamental uh, frequency. In other words, this frequency is just twice the frequency of the fundamental. The frequency associated with this third spike is three times the frequency of the fundamental. And here it's four times that. Okay, good. Now, if you don't remember uh, what overtones are, like, or partials or these things, I have a video about that. It's one of the initial videos and it should be linked uh, up here. Okay, so now we've seen how we can move basically from the time domain to the frequency domain, but still the Fourier transform is a completely black box for us. Now, I want to start unravel it for you guys and give you an understanding of how the this process and the Fourier transform works. But for that, what I want to do is zoom into the waveform and actually uh, ha be at a resolution where we can actually see like all the cycles in um, the wave associated with this sound. Okay, so for doing that, be before we do that, yeah, let's let's take a look at, it, at a few numbers. So the length uh, of the signal, or in other words, the number of samples that we have, it's around 34,000 samples. The sampling rate, if I remember correctly here, should be 22,050 hertz. And the duration of each sample is the inverse of that, which is 4 times 10 uh, to... Um, the power of minus five. So it's a very, very short amount of time for each sample. Now, uh, let's take a look at the duration of a cycle for our fundamental frequency, so 523 hertz. And so obviously this is one divided by 523. And if you take a look at this result, so this is uh, almost two milliseconds. So we have a cycle every two milliseconds. So now what I want to do is just like zoom in and to into the uh, waveform and only consider 400 samples because 400 samples are going to give us uh, 0.02 seconds. And this is this will enable us to see more or less like 10 uh, cycles of our waveforms and that is something like that we can definitely visualize okay so all of that to say that um i have like this new plot where we zoom into the waveform and here i'm only considering 400 uh, samples in other words i'm slicing the signal which is on the uh, y-axis and I'm only considering the, the samples between uh, like 10,000 and 10,400, uh, okay? So let's take a look at this and here you have the results. So now we are at a resolution where we can actually see the, um, all the cycles. Okay, so now what's the point of all of this? Well, the point is that uh, what we want to do is to actually compare this signal against sinusoids with different um, frequencies, okay? And see the similarity there. So, and I want to show you how we can do that visually. Okay, so now let me just go back here and I want to uh, remind you of the uh, equation for a sine wave, which is given like by this uh, formula here. So it's like the sine of two pi uh, which uh, multiplies f uh, t times t, where f is the frequency, t is just time, minus phi, where phi is the phase. And we'll see what the phase does in a uh, second. Okay, so yeah, let's just go back here. 
So the thing that we want to do here is just create a sinusoid. And here I'll put the frequency equal to 523, which is our fundamental frequency. For the time being, we'll have a phase uh, of zero. And here we have our function, our sine wave over here. Okay, and then I'm just gonna plot that once again uh, between 10,000 samples and 10,400. Uh, samples, so just 400 samples, so that we can uh, kind of like superimpose this to the original signal uh, in, in a few minutes. Okay, so here we have our nice uh, sinusoid at fi 523 hertz. Now, let's take a look at the phase. So, what does uh, the uh, phase do? Well, for that, what I suggest doing is just create another. Um, another um, a sinusoid, which we'll call over here. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to work <laughs> with this extra big cursor. So over here, so this is phase two. Everything else will be uh, like the same. So we'll just like change the phase here. And obviously I need to plot sign two as well over here. It's not there, it's down here. And I'll use say, I don't know, like a yellow color, color for this. Okay, so now uh, let's use the same face. And so if we use the same face, uh, so we have a mistake here. Oh yes, because this is face two, okay. So let's go, yeah, and obviously like the two uh, sinusoids are completely aligned on top of each other. But now, if I change the phase, say like I go 0.2 for uh, sinusoid, the, the yellow sinusoid, uh, you'll see that the um, sinusoid is now shifting, shifting towards the right. If I get to 0.5, the sinusoids are completely like in opposite phase. So in other words, when we have a peak uh, with the red sinusoid, we have a deep uh, with the uh, yellow sinusoid and vice versa. And the closer I get to, to one and the closer I'm just like realigning them. And so once uh, we are back at one, so they are aligned once again. So what this means is that if I continue giving like higher numbers for phase two, we'll just like start again the, the circle because yeah, I mean, we are like using a, a periodic function in the end, okay? So 1.5, it's basically equal to, uh, we get like the same function of uh, the same sine wave that we had for a, a 0 0.5. And if we go to, if we change the phase to two, well, once again, we are just back to the um, to being aligned once again with the uh, initial sine wave. Okay, so all of this to say that we can assume that the phase moves between zero and one just because uh, the the function is periodic. Okay, so now what's the big deal like with this uh, sine waves, right? So the point is that we want to compare. Uh, the signal and the sinusoids. If you guys uh, remember what I said with the deeper intuition, so uh, in order to to move from the frequency from the time domain to the frequency domain, we compared the signal with sinusoids of various uh, frequencies, and then for each frequency we get a magnitude and a phase. Okay, and that and high magnitude indicates high similarity between the signal and a sinusoid. Now let's see how this actually applies here visually. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm plotting uh, both uh, the original signal as well as a, a sinusoid here, and the sinusoid is going to be shown in red. Okay, and here for the sinusoid, I'm using the fundamental frequency, so 523, and the phase is set at uh, zero. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Okay, that's really cool. But as you can see, we, I mean, like the two uh, waveforms, like more or less like seem to have like a similar, uh, like 
cycle, right? So a similar frequency, and that's because obviously the original signal has the fundamental, which is at 523, uh, but they are somewhat out of phase. So we want to align those. So how do we do that? Well, we can just uh, increase the phase and see what happens. So let me redo this. And as you can see, now we are kind of aligning the two. And I know because I've tried it before that we have a very good alignment when we use a phase which is equal to 0 0.5555. And here we go. So as you can see now the two um, signals are quite uh, like aligned. They're quite similar. But here we are talking about similarity. So how do we calculate similarity? Well, we have many ways of calculating similarities for two functions. But one that's like very intuitive and simple is to combine the two signals by multiplying them. And in this case, it would be a multiplication sample by sample. So point by point, we multiply the two signals. And then we just look at the area so we add all the positive areas and so we fill like the, the area below uh, the, um, the new combined signal and we add the positive area and we subtract the negative area. So let me explain what that is. And for doing that, uh, we just add this line of code here, which I already had prepared. So, and as you can see here on the y-axis, we are now multiplying the sine um, signal with the original signal and we'll have the color of this combined signal in yellow so let's see what happens here okay and uh, you can see this now uh, I'm taking the area in other words I'm filling up the area below uh, the the waveform and as you can see here we have basically it's all like positive area and the intuition here is that the higher the area, the positive area uh, that we have for the combined signal, and the higher the similarity uh, between the two original, the two signals, so the sinusoid as well as the original signal. And the intuition behind this is that if I, uh, when I multiply both of this and they have uh, the same sign, so they're both, uh, so the signal and the uh, sinusoid have both like positive sign or both negative sign, then they're going to end up with like a positive value, right? Whereas uh, if they have uh, alternate opposite signs, then we'll end up like with negative values. And so when we add like that positive area to the negative area, we just end up with a uh, value that tells us how much similar these two uh, signals uh, really are. Okay, but uh, one thing that I want to show you here is that if I change the phase here, so let's assume uh, we go down to uh, zero. So phase is equal to zero. Now, all of a sudden, we have all negative areas, right? And so there's no similarity at all. Even if we have the same sine wave, so with the, with the same frequency and amplitude, but still the phase is extremely important But because in this case, uh, it's just, there's no similarity whatsoever. So we only have like negative areas here, uh, negative values for the combined um, sine wave, not sine wave, <laughs> for the combined signal. Okay. So if we go and say take a 0.2, for example, uh, yeah, still this is mostly like negative, but now let's try 0.4. Okay, yeah, this is a good example. So with phase at 0.4, we have uh, a bit of negative areas as well as a bit of positive areas. So yeah, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. There's some level of like similarity between the two. Uh, signals, but it's not uh, perfect. Okay, so this is the intuition uh, that uh, we can use to understand how we move from uh, the time domain to the frequency domain. And it's just as simple as doing a bunch of things. So we choose a frequency first, and then 
we create a sine wave out of like that frequency, then the next step is we want to optimize for the phase so that we know that we've chosen the phase that gives the maximum similarity, so the maximum area possible. And finally, we calculate the magnitude. And the magnitude is basically the similarity, or in other words, the positive area of the combined signal uh, minus the um, negative area, okay? But this is just for one single frequency. In a Fourier transform, we have to try and do this for all possible frequencies in the real set, okay? So we start with a frequency, then we, we continue and do like the same steps for the next frequency and we move on and on and on and on. And by doing so, we are able to see which frequencies have a, an import, are important components of the original signals. And those will be um, kind of indicated by, because they have a high value for the magnitude. And this is like what happens here. So if we go back here, so here we see like the, the spectrum once again. So yeah, let me just find, let's just go back to, to the best uh, phase that I could find, so 0.55. So as you can see here, uh, the fact that we have like this nice alignment between the uh, frequency at uh, the sinusoid at 523 hertz and the original signal is reflected in the power spectrum here. And that's because we have this peak in the magnitude, which is around 523 hertz. So that tells us that we have this high level of similarity between the sine wave at the pure tone at 523 hertz and the original signal. Okay, so this is uh, interesting. So now I hope like you, you get the understanding and the intuition behind the Fourier transform. Now the next step is to take a look at a little bit of mathematical formalization of what we've said so far. And don't be scared about like this massive uh, equation here. So I'll just like break it down for you. But in, in a nutshell, this is what we've just said. So what we are looking for here is the phase for like the optimized phase for a given frequency f, okay? So these two things that we have in here is just the multiplication of the signal and the sinusoid. So S of t is just our original signal and here we have our sinusoid and we multiply those. Now, the next step is to calculate the area and we do that with this integral um, symbol. Now, you don't need to understand uh, calculus, but the intuition here is that we are basically calculating the uh, positive area of the combined signal and then sub subtract to that the negative uh, area. And that's what we are doing with the integral, you know, which is across time. So it's basically, we, we take like all uh, the, the, the time throughout like the uh, a given signal. And finally, what we do is we take the arc max. In other words, we want to select the phase in the interval 0, 1, and we saw why we only consider 0, 1. Uh, and so we want to take like this phase that maximizes the area. And in other words, what we are doing here is what I was doing manually before, tweaking the phase in order to find the phase that would actually and maximize the positive area that we have when we combine the two signals. Okay, so it's this is simple intuition to understand. Okay, the next step that we wanna do is to actually take the um, magnitude. And so how do we take the magnitude? Well, it's basically the same thing, right? So we are once again calculating the uh, combining the two signals and then we calculate the area 
uh, that we have once we multiply the original signal with the sinusoid. And finally, this is only the only step that's different from the, the previous one that we saw. Uh, we just want to select the max area and uh, for selecting that, we're gonna try like all the possible like uh, values for a phase between zero and one. But if we have that value uh, already, because we've optimized before, we'll just use that value and plug it in here directly. It's important to say that the calculations that we've carried out here are in a continuous space. In other words, uh, because we use this integral here, we're basically assuming that time is continuous, or in other words, uh, like time is a real number. It changes as a real number. Okay, so time is continuous, but frequency is continuous as well, right? So while this is the case for the, the theory, well, what we've done already, for example, uh, with our code uh, doesn't, uh, use like continuous representation uh, just because uh, computers can't use continuous representation. We have to sample a continuous function and use a discrete version of that. Now, uh, if you want to know more about continuous versus um, discrete uh, signals, I suggest you to go ch check out one of my first videos on this topic. Uh, but the whole point here that I want to make is that the theory that we're going to study at least like over the next couple of videos is going to be about continuous Fourier uh, transform. But then we'll move on and take a look at the discrete Fourier transform. And there the math is going to be slightly different. And uh, that is going to be the math that we'll actually be using for understanding how to implement an algorithm that can extract the Fourier transform in the case of discrete signals. Okay, so uh, up until now, you, you've learned how to move from the time domain to the frequency domain, but you may be wondering, is there a way of going the other way around? So the round trip, so we go from time to frequency domain, but then can we go to frequency domain to time domain? And this would be the equivalent of saying, okay, so now we start with these uh, different like color bands, we put them into the prism, this fantastic algorithm, and we end up with the with a complex uh, light wave. Okay, can we do that with the Fourier transform? And the answer is yes. We can reconstruct a signal by superimposing all the sinusoids, all the frequency components that uh, we've extracted out of the original signal. So we superimpose the sinusoids and we weight them by their relative magnitude. So the ones that uh, have a higher magnitude are gonna have like a higher impact in making the original signal. And then obviously we want to use the, uh, the original, the face that we extracted as well. And the point here is that the original signal and the Fourier transform have the same information and we can go back and forth from time to frequency domain as we please. So um, the process of going back from frequency domain to time domain is called inverse Fourier transform. So we start from the frequency domain, we apply an inverse Fourier transform and we go all the way back to the original signal in the time domain. Okay, so this is like an idea that's not exactly the same as that of additive synthesis, but it's kind of like similar. So in additive synthesis, you have synthesizers which basically use different sinusoids and you can superimpose them. So combine them by adding them up. Um, in order to create complex sounds. And if you think about it, this is somewhat similar to what we were saying with the uh, inverse Fourier transform. So let me show you these in a, an example. So I found uh, like this very cool uh, website so where you can try out uh, additive synthesis. So here like you have uh, a bunch of different frequencies so here, this is like C4, so 261 hertz. Then we have 523, 
hertz, which is C5, which is the fundamental frequency of our uh, sound. And then you go up. So basically here you have like all the overtones of this C4 fundamental uh, frequency. Okay, so let's unmute this. So you should be able to, yeah, let me just put this down a little bit. Okay, so you should be able to, to hear this C4, right? So now let me add uh, the first overturn and take a look at how the main signal is going to be modified. Right. Okay, so let me add some other overturns. Just go down a little bit. Okay, that's cool, isn't it? Cool. So this is like a really cool example of how we can superimpose pure, pure turns or sinusoids and get a complex waveform like this one. Okay. So yeah, I guess like this was it for this introductory session on a Fourier transform. So now, where do we go from here? Well, we want to start looking into the math, the real math behind the Fourier transform. And for doing that, we are going to need to get familiar with another type of numbers that perhaps you've heard or you're familiar with. But if you're not, I suggest you check out my next video, which is going to be on complex numbers. And as we'll see in a, in a few videos, complex numbers are going to be very important for working with Fourier transforms because they're very handy for representing what we're doing here. Okay. So that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video and you found it useful. If that's the case, please remember to leave a like. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. If you have any questions or doubts in your mind about what I've covered today, please don't hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below. I guess I'll see you next time. Cheers.